Graph, we will start with the uh, talks. So first I'll introduce you and I will, we will leave it, then open it to you, sir. Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to 16th edition of Sambad Talk. Today we have an another distinguished INE fellow, Professor Vijay Chandru. Professor Vijay Chandru is an academic and an entrepreneur, a technology pioneer of the World Economic Forum since 2006 and recognized as 50 pioneers of change by India Today magazine in 2008. Professor Chandru mentors numerous entrepreneurs and early stage ventures in the realms of education, technology, and life sciences. An alumnus of Bits Pilani, where he was trained in electrical engineering and went to get a doctorate degree from MIT in 1982. His training in electrical engineering at Bits Pilani and operational research at UCL and MIT led him to explore academic research at the interface of computational mathematics with geometry, logic, machine learning, biology, and heritage art. His academic career in mathematical sciences has spanned over four decades as a research scientist and as a professor at Purdue University, IBM's TJ Watson Center, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, UPenn, Stanford, and MIT. At Strand Life Sciences, India's first example of academic entrepreneurship, Professor Chandra served as the founder executive chairman from inception in 2000 till 2018. Professor Chandru has also co-founded the Simputer Trust, which designed and manufactured India's first indigenous handheld computers at the start of the millennium. Professor Chandru has also been actively engaged in digital humanities since 2009 and is a founder trustee of the Botik International Institute for Art, Culture and Democracy, funded largely by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India under the research program in Indian Digital Heritage. Professor Chandru is deeply engaged with the idea of technology levers for bringing universal healthcare to India. This manifests in his work as a commissioner with the Lankit Citizens Commission for reimagining India's health systems. The mission for No Disease Orphan by 2030 has been actioned through his founder engagements with Center for Health and Education Technologies at International Institute for Art, Culture and Democracy as well as in the hematological disorders with the open platform for orphan disease at Oxford Foundation. Professor Chandru was elected as the Fellow of the Indian National Academy of Sciences in 1996 and the Indian National Academy of Engineers in 2010. He has received the Devang Mehta Award for Innovation in Information Technology for the Development of Simputer in the year 2001. In 2006, Chandru received the uh, Professor Chandru received the President's Medal for of Informs. He also received the Biospectrum Biotech Entrepreneur in the year 2007 and was the honorary president of ABLE, the apex body of Indian biotechnology industry for a three-year term from the year 2009 to 2012. Please join in me in welcoming Professor Vijay Chandru to Samvad. Sir, it's a pleasure to have you on Sabmad and thanks for accepting the invitation. Before I hand over, I request the audience to post their question in Q&A box on the lower right side of the screen. Sir, thank you. Welcome to Sambhat and over to you, sir. Uh, Namaskara. Thank you and uh, for that overly generous uh, introduction. Um, uh, let me live up to that now. I uh, Let me uh, bring up the uh, presentation. Um, yeah. yeah, just give me a second here. Um, are you all able to see it? Uh, yes, sir. yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, thank you. I, um, uh, you know, uh, as was mentioned, I started out uh, as an electrical engineer, and I think electrical engineers are, in some sense, the new physicists, right? We are, uh, uh, we generally uh, poke our noses into all kinds of different areas because uh, I think we, we are trained to think uh, that we can have impact uh, with uh, modeling and systems view in any different uh, domains. So uh, so I think uh, uh, my, career, my path uh, for the last four decades has certainly taken me through many different areas. And uh, 
Today, I think I thought I, I will focus on, in some sense, um, this synthesis of uh, uh, biology and computation, which I think is uh, is very exciting and uh, sort of positioning this as a uh, as understanding this uh, uh, connection from digital to living machines and uh, and how this could actually affect uh, the future uh, of uh, of the of the world in some sense, right? And uh, so uh, let me begin with uh, this very interesting. Uh, diagram, which is from a book called The Second Machine Age. Um, and if you if you notice, there are two curves on this uh, on this plot, and uh, they're both almost coincident. Uh, one is plotting uh, human social development index, and the other is just plotting population uh, of, of the Earth's population. And it's, of course, the time scale is huge. It's going from 8,000 BC to uh, to current day. And as you can see, uh, it's essentially uh, flat pretty much, and then turns upwards uh, in the 20th century and uh, uh, it starts bending, you know, probably in the 18th uh, century. So uh, this is uh, essentially uh, a, uh, a mapping of how um, uh, the uh, you know industrial revolution um, you know uh, because of uh, um, you know the discovery of uh, of the steam engine and, uh, and then how that led to uh, factories and then uh, the uh, invention of electricity and uh, and then uh, you go get to industry 3.0 which uh, computing and automation uh, is covered most of the period that i worked uh, and uh, and then in the last uh, 15 years or so uh, we seem to have entered a, a new era of uh, what is called uh, industry 4.0 or cognitive uh, period and we will talk a little bit of uh, how that might have happened. And of course, uh, you know, some of the advances that we're seeing uh, are very rapid and uh, and very important. Um, and whether it's in, you know, or, uh, automation and uh, autonomous vehicles or uh, robots or uh, various aspects of uh, uh, of artificial intelligence and so on that uh, that we are starting to see, but uh, uh, that's uh, that's one uh, perspective here. Uh, but at the same time, I think the uh, the world is at a very very difficult situation, as uh, as we all know. I think um, there is um, there are many serious challenges and there are mounting crises. Uh, we seem to you know, uh, have uh, energy security threats. Uh, of course, part of it is created by the the conflict uh, in Russia and Ukraine. But uh, uh, but generally, I think we are going. We are moving more and more towards an, an energy security threat. Uh, there's certainly a food security threat, which uh, is not uh, able to feed the Earth's population. Um, and, um, and, you know, in many ways, uh, the pandemics and so on that we've just experienced um, show that uh, we have some challenges with, uh, with one health, uh, that is uh, zoonotic diseases, viruses, and so on, uh, coming into the human health uh, sector from, uh, from our ecosystems, right? And um, and then finally, uh, you know, we are all we have been facing all these uh, challenges because of climate change, change in monsoon, uh, and um, you know various uh, uh, tsunamis and so on. So definitely, there's a climate change threat uh, that we are also facing. And the question is, uh, can technology save us? Right? And as technologists, I think we are the the uh, 
the only optimists around. <laughs> so, so I think we have to be uh, very proactive now and uh, essentially uh, show that uh, we can provide some solutions that uh, that could actually uh, allay some of these uh, challenges and uh, crises that uh, that humanity is facing. And um, but you know, in order to uh, really uh, use technology for impact and translation, um, requires a certain transdisciplinarity and coordination, and a lot of discipline. Uh, and I call it the moonshot discipline. Uh, which is uh, sort of reflecting how we need to be very focused on on the uh, deliverables and uh, impact of uh, what we do. And um, so uh, going back, uh, what is the specific technologies that I'm alluding to? I think uh, my training is in the computational decision sciences and we all know that uh, you know it's been very exciting in the post-war uh, period. Uh, World War II uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, was the the time in which people started thinking about uh, computing machines, and uh, you know, all of you are aware of the work done by Alan Turing and others in uh, conceiving, uh, you know, uh, uh, computing machines. And uh, you know, not uh, far behind was uh, Claude Shannon uh, formulating information theory, and all of this was getting applied to the logistics of military operations. And uh, so the whole idea of operational research came about because uh, because of that connection. And um, and the uh, and we've seen a steady. Uh, growth of all of this and uh, possibly uh, around to mid uh, the first decade of this millennium around 2005 2006 uh, we started seeing uh, advances in computational methods that actually have now brought us into the era of what we might call cyber physical systems in fact i'm giving you this uh, lecture from uh, the building where uh, at IIC we have the Robert Bosch uh, Center for Cyber Physical Systems, and uh, we have the AI and Robotics Tech Park. And I'm actually giving you uh, the stock from from Art Park at uh, at IIC. So cyber physical systems, uh, you know, uh, you you uh, can think of them in very different modes. Uh, intelligent systems or AI or intelligence augmentation or intelligence infrastructure. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is having impact in almost everything, uh, every domain and every type of engineering and scientific discipline. So uh, I don't have to say a lot more about it. Now, why is it that uh, information technology has become so important and uh, so impactful? And, um, and of course, uh, we all know that uh, there's been this uh, incredible exponential improvement in um, in information technologies, mainly because of uh, the hardware improvements that were possible. Um, and uh, this sometimes is called Moore's law. Gordon Moore was the chairman of Intel, and uh, he pointed out that uh, if you actually looked at uh, improvements in, um, you know, the chip technologies and the density of chips and our ability to uh, give you faster, uh, cheaper, um, you know, technology uh, for information processing. Um, it was uh, following a kind of an exponential law, which basically said it was doubling in capabilities every 18 months. And, um, and that, uh, when you put it on a log scale, uh, is the, the black line, the straight line, which we call Moore's law. And um, now, interestingly, there's another exponential law uh, that uh, 
you know, at the turn of the millennium, uh, uh, started uh, uh, with uh, the first uh, sequence of the human genome and how that uh, uh, has also been following sort of an exponential path. In fact, in some ways, even faster than Moore's law. And uh, particularly so since about 2007 or so, uh, when a technique called next gen sequencing uh, was developed, uh, which was essentially a, a parallelization of uh, uh, what was called Sanger sequencing, which, uh, uh, which was a classical technique for sequencing DNA. And uh, the real inventor of this was uh, Shankar Balasubramaniam, who is a chemistry professor at the University of Cambridge, now knighted as uh, Sir Shankar Balasubramaniam. And uh, he developed a machine called the Solexa machine. Uh, but the commercialization was done in the US. Uh, Solexa was uh, acquired by a, an existing US company called Flatley. I mean, called uh, Illumina, and uh, Jay Flatley, who was the CEO at that time and now the chairman of the company, um, like uh, Gordon Moore uh, at Intel, uh, Flatley has taken that uh, Solexa technology and uh, and created an extraordinary uh, uh, impact in uh, in biology, with, uh, and that has come to be known as Flatley's law. And uh, today we are very close to having uh, an ability to sequence a human genome for about a hundred dollars. Like uh, um, it, uh, 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 you know, the actual price in the market might be elevated a little bit, but uh, but the capability is there to do it at a hundred dollars. And uh, at high volumes, those numbers are achievable. So. Um, uh, so we have two exponential laws that are operating. And in some sense, my talk today is about how these uh, synthesize and how we, we can, um, you know, of these technologies has created something quite uh, substantial. So it's also interesting that, uh, that both the uh, molecular biology and computational science actually uh, both uh, followed more or less the same timeline. Both started around uh, the end of World War II, uh, the famous uh, uh, discovery of the double helical structure of, uh, of DNA by Watson, Crick, uh, um, and uh, Wilkes and uh, Rosalind, I think, uh, uh, then the work of Fred Sanger on uh, sequencing, uh, using Sanger uh, sequencing methods, uh, which um, could sequence uh, short uh, sequences of DNA, uh, and uh, and then that leading to next generation sequencing. Uh, at uh, of course, first it led to the Human Genome Project which is a great collaborative project. You know, several countries also joined in. And um, the, the first human genome sequence from end to end was published around 2003. And uh, soon after uh, next generation sequencing that we just talked about was developed. And, and today we are at a very interesting um, uh, stage where we have two technologies running neck and neck and uh, and uh, uh, at ex extraordinary uh, capabilities. So uh, we often use this analogy of uh, greens on a chessboard to understand what exponential really means. And this is, of course, the famous story of, uh, um, you know, the mendicant asking the king for uh, one grain of rice on the first uh, square of the chessboard and then asking for two grains and four grains and eight grains and so on, doubling on every square. And uh, by the time you get to two to the 32, uh, uh, you're at about four billion grains. And uh, 
and then you realize that uh, if you had to go all the way to 64, um, there wouldn't be enough grains, um, you know, on this earth, right? So, uh, so that's the power of exponential, and and as you can see in the plot here, uh, at two to the thirty-two, you're sort of approaching a near vertical uh, uh, curve, and so uh, that sometimes people call it a singularity, and you know, so we are riding a singularity once we go past the. Uh, get into the second half of the chessboard. So when did the second half of the chessboard actually happen for information technology? Um, semiconductors uh, uh, were the first factories and so on were set up uh, around 1958. So roughly by about six, uh, we had uh, doubled, according to Moore's law, uh, 32 times and we were in the second half, um, and you could see, in fact, uh, that various uh, aspects of uh, information processing technologies just took off uh, after around that uh, time point. And um, even with for things like deep learning and so on, just the creation of uh, GPUs and adapting GPUs for, um, for doing the initial deep learning experiments was uh, was all around this time right and um, and similarly for genomics uh, I think uh, it came a little bit later because next gen sequencing um, which is sort of the VLSI equivalent uh, really uh, uh, began uh, only around 2007 eight and and now we see the the impact of that Right. And uh, so that is also now a second half uh, of the chessboard technology. Uh, why is genomics important? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, most of you probably know this, but just to repeat, um, the DNA is the essentially the code of life, uh, uh, which is in every cell, uh, and um, and. You know, it is from that code that through a process of transcription, uh, we uh, generate RNA and from the RNA uh, through translation, we generate proteins. And uh, so, and the proteins are what do uh, uh, all the work in, in an organism and uh, essentially uh, make uh, life possible, right? So, so uh, essentially, uh, the DNA is the basic code. It's the source code in some sense of, of biology. Um, DNA is organized into chromosomes. Uh, there are 23 of them. And, um, and the X and Y chromosome uh, differentiate between uh, you know, female and male. Uh, and um, um, the... Uh, uh, at this point, uh, we really uh, uh, only have been concerned largely with um, the parts of the DNA that actually encode for uh, the genes um, and uh, which actually then translate into the proteins. And uh, these parts are called the exons. And then when you uh, piece these exons together, you get... Uh, uh, you get the genes, and from those genes, the, the proteins get uh, expressed. So, um, and that fraction is perhaps a, a small portion of the DNA. The entire DNA is about 3 billion ACGT letters um, from end to end. Uh, and since it's a double helix, it's 6 billion, but, uh, but there is a... a a mapping between the two strands of the helix. So, so we know uh, uh, in, from an information content, it's 3 billion. And maybe less than 2% of that are actually coding for uh, genes that uh, seem to be important from, from a organism point of view. And um, in the Human Genome Project actually took a, an average uh, uh, DNA. So I think uh, 
Several individuals were selected uh, by and and that's how the human reference genome was created. And if you print the whole thing and stack it up, it's uh, it goes several stories high. But uh, so this is actually a printed uh, version of the human reference genome that is in some museum in, in England. But, uh, um, but the fact that we were we actually found that code, we were able to read it. Um, then uh, for the first maybe 10 years or so after um, the first human gene genome reference genome was published, uh, most of the work was to annotate that genome and understand what all these genes and you know what the code actually meant and uh, how changing any of that could could cause uh, disease and so that understanding of interpreting what that code actually meant uh, took a uh, um, lot of experimentation and and inferencing and so on. And uh, there, there was a lot of computational and experimental work involved uh, in that. Uh, but the first impacts of all of this, we started seeing around 2010. And the first uh, impact that is well known is uh, that of a little boy who uh, called Nicholas Volker, who had about 100 surgeries and was developing you know all these uh, problems of inflammation in his intestines and um, and then uh, they actually at the University of Wisconsin uh, sequenced um, uh, Nick Volker's uh, genome and they actually detected uh, a, a mutation in a particular gene uh, confirming that this was a genetic disorder and if he could uh, be given a bone marrow transplant, then um, then he could be uh, cured. So so that was done, and uh, here you see a picture of uh, sorry uh, of Nicholas Volker with uh, uh, I think Dr. Howard uh, Jacob uh, who actually did the sequencing. Uh, you can't see Howard's face because of the, the mask and so on. Uh, but um, that boy today is uh, now uh, a teenager and uh, and uh, you know is doing well. He he went on to go to school and college, and he's uh, uh, he's growing up uh, healthy. And so it was a great uh, case study. Uh, um, there have been many such, and I put up a couple of other examples of. Um, uh, there is uh, solving various neuromuscular disorders and uh, and uh, Larry Smar uh, uh, be began this whole movement called quantified self where people actually sequence themselves and monitor themselves in various ways and uh, and actually know some of their own health uh, parameters and today you know we all wear Fitbits and uh, so we're all sort of starting to participate in this quantified self. Uh, idea and um, and of course genomics uh, is part of that uh, where you can get your genome sequence and uh, know a little bit about your own uh, health traits and so on. Um, of course, there was the famous Angelina Jolie effect uh, uh, in 2012-13. She, uh, because of her Ashkenazi Jewish uh, ancestry, was concerned uh, her mother and her aunt had died of uh, breast and ovarian cancers and uh, she suspected that she might be carrying uh, deleterious uh, mutations and she was when she tested and uh, therefore after she had her children uh, she decided to take a drastic step and have a, a double mastectomy and your uh, oophorectomy uh, to actually remove her ovaries and reduce the the risk of uh, breast or ovarian cancer. She was at about an 87% risk of cancer uh, before the surgeries and after the surgeries, it was down to just a few percentage. 
point. So, uh, you know, it, uh, she rationalized why she did that. And I think it made, uh, uh, it had a profound effect and that many women started uh, uh, being more receptive to the idea of uh, taking uh, preventive steps. Uh, so it was around this time, 2013, that uh, we had spun out a company called uh, Strand uh, from um, Indian Institute of Science. And Strand had been building many of the initial tools for um, uh, for the uh, annotation of the human genome. And so we were actually quite well prepared. And uh, once next generation sequencing machines were available at a reasonable cost, we uh, set up lab laboratories to, to actually provide uh, this kind of genomic service in India. And um, so by 2013, we had established our first labs and uh, um, and one of the early cases, and I just wanted to go through a small case study with you because I think it brings out uh, why this uh, is so important and impactful, right? And uh, so um, this was a situation where they were a family that had had two children, both the first and the second child were, were male childs and both died. Uh, within sort of the first uh, year or so of uh, their birth. Um, and they both had uh, certain phenotypes, so large bulging eyes and uh, some respiratory problems and, and uh, various uh, issues with hypertension and so on. Um, so I'm not going through all the details, but you can read about it in this book that my colleague uh, Ramesh Haryaran uh, has written for Genomic Quirks. And uh, this book is available at uh, through the IISC Press, but it's also available on Amazon and other places. Um, that's a picture of Ramesh. I've sort of made him out to be a Sherlock Holmes. Um, <clears throat> but it's, um, it's basically, these are all detective stories because um, he, you know, every time we encountered a case like this, there was, uh, we would do the sequencing of, uh, so in this case, uh, the medical geneticist who had contacted us, who knew the family, uh, had a sample of the second child. And also we could get samples of the parents. So we were able to sequence them. And um, But when you sequence, you see a lot of mutations and different variants, tens of thousands of them. and. Um, and then you have to figure out which ones actually make sense, which could have been the culprit uh, mutations could have, that could have caused uh, these two children to have premature deaths. And, um, and the various uh, sieving techniques based on uh, published literature, knowledge, and uh, understanding of uh, disease pathways uh, led us to two particular possible um, mutations in two genes, uh, fibrillin and filament uh, A, and um, and we finally were able to uh, narrow it down to one particular uh, culprit uh, marker. And this was completely novel. I mean, no one had observed this earlier. And, uh, um, and then uh, um, we, of course, needed to understand it better because, uh, uh, you know, this was the first time it had been received and, uh, you know, identified as causing this problem. And then we went into a lot of uh, literature analysis to, to be able to characterize uh, the particular uh, 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 variant and the, and the disorders it was causing. And, uh, this um, at this point, the geneticist came back to us and said, "Well, the couple is uh, pregnant again with uh, with a third uh, possible uh, delivery, and um, now they want to know if they should have the child or abort." And um, and that was in the fifteenth week of pregnancy, so we had uh, very little time. But uh, uh, and you know. 
we suddenly realized that we were going to be advising, uh, uh, you know, on a life and death uh, uh, choice. And um, I think the seriousness of that uh, was really impactful. I think we were we are not physicians by training. We're, as I said, the electrical engineers. Of course, we had biologists as well in the company by then, um, and um, and so. Anyway, we, the, the story actually has a happy ending. We were able to tell the parents that, uh, that the, the fetus uh, uh, was, uh, did not have this marker. And uh, from ultrasounds, we could see that the phenotypes, uh, the, the, the flattening of the bridge of the nose and so on, all of that was not there in this child. Uh, there was also one other factor which we didn't Actually, we couldn't reveal to the parents, uh, which was that the, the baby was a girl. And because she was a girl, they, uh, the X-linked disorder, uh, which had affected the male children, uh, was not going to affect uh, this child. But we couldn't quite tell them that, right? Because uh, there's a law against uh, revealing the, the gender of the fetus. Uh, so, but uh, we were able to tell them that uh, since the FLNA marker was not active, you know, the, the chances were that the baby would be all right. Uh, they went ahead and had the baby and, uh, and she, the child is fine. But, uh, you know, this was, uh, this was our, in some sense, our first experience of uh, what it means to take all this technology and actually apply it to, um, to a real, uh, you know, human interest uh, situation. So, um, well, that got us going, I think, by about uh, uh, 2018, we were deep into clinical solutions, and and today we uh, we offer all kinds of uh, diagnostic services and and continue to do a lot of R&D on, uh, on genomics uh, at Strand. Um, as I was saying, um, in the initial years, we did a lot of work on developing the tools that helped us to get uh, to these precision medicine solutions. And, and these tools um, actually became gold standards. And so very few people, you know, the tools that uh, came out of Strand actually, um, you know, had a huge impact uh, in research as well. Um, uh, we have over 27,000, probably closer to 30,000 citations in literature that actually talk about uh, experimental studies where these tools were used to draw the inferences. And uh, um, when we went ahead and started the clinical work, uh, we actually built a whole AI platform. And we were a little bit annoyed because the IBM uh, you know, talking about Watson and how Watson would do this and that. So we called our platform Ramanujan itself. It was superior anyway. So, uh, so Ramanujan uh, became a code name for the platforms we had built. And uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of uh, computer science and AI and so on that went into this, uh, um, you know, there are about 22 million, 23 million now publications um, in research biology, which, uh, uh, which you know, get cat uh, cataloged and Medline and so on. And we had to build a uh, uh, natural language processing engine, the text mining engines that could go and read all of this literature and extract the knowledge that would be needed in order to be able to draw these inferences. And so back in 2004, 2005, we actually built uh, uh, an NLP engine called Grammatica, which uh, actually encoded all the rules of, uh, of English grammar and, uh, and then was applied to, uh, in some sense, the, um, the ontologies and uh, the terminology that was used in research publications. And, um, and we were able to extract um, relationships and diagrammatic uh, 
uh, causality dry diagrams which uh, which were uh, constructed into what are called biological pathways which uh, which could help help us in understanding um, the and interpret uh, experimental results where you would say that some gene is over expressing or under expressing and now what is the impact of that the, the pathway would actually indicate what would happen right um, these were then built into uh, systems platforms um, that could even run on the cloud and uh, and so these these platforms are used today for the routine um, diagnostic work that uh, that happens in the labs at uh, at strand uh, using these platforms we've been able to now do uh, you know uh, several tens of thousands of case studies across the indian population and uh, we have found for example like angelina jolie did um, you know various uh, markers of uh, breast and ovarian cancer in indian women and uh, and these have been published and the data has been <clears throat> provided as supplementary data in the publication. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, similarly, for uh, various other cancers, we're not looking at genetic predisposition, but once the cancer develops, what is the actual uh, genomic uh, signatures in the tumors? And um, and then um, using those signatures, we're able to select pharmacologically uh, the the better medicines, the targeted therapies, um, the less toxic chemotherapies, and so on. Um, with this whole area is called uh, personalized med medicine and uh, uh, or precision medicine sometimes, and so precision oncology has been a major focus uh, for uh, this type of applications. And um, and now we're at a stage where we're starting to be able to, just from a blood draw or a urine sample or a saliva sample, uh, get very early indications of uh, onset of cancer and uh, without actually having to get a, a physical biopsy. The, these are working with fluids, body fluids. Which are much easier to collect, right? So, and this might be the future where we are able to detect cancer very early and uh, be able to uh, provide uh, much better treatment uh, for patients who are diagnosed with cancer. Um, so, I'll uh, sort of change gears now a little bit and uh, go to the next idea, which is actually uh, not. On not just reading the the genomic sequence, but also being able to modify it and change it. And uh, this gets us into the field of what is called uh, synthetic biology or writing the genome. And uh, in many ways, this is where we're really going to see huge impact, not just in human health, but you know, in uh, plants, in animals, and uh, in microbials that could be used for various industrial processes and um, and so this is being viewed as uh, as a you know as a big leap in uh, technology because uh, um, in fact the financial times called this uh, greatest discovery since darwin uh, because uh, you know this is uh, one of the reasons why we are excited about uh, and we need to reimagine what the future of the world will be if we are able to leverage all of these uh, technologies. Um, the, the financial impact of these technologies is also huge and uh, the addressable market runs into trillions of dollars. So, so there's a huge uh, business uh, imperative also to, to work out these. So, um, the the two uh, women who actually uh, developed uh, a technique called CRISPR, which is a kind of a cut and paste technique for DNA, um, were um, uh, Jennifer Doudna from Berkeley and 
um, Emmanuel Charpentier uh, from um, uh, France, who is now actually the Max Planck in Germany, and um, and uh, their uh, uh, their work uh, indicated that uh, there are um, particular patterns in DNA that have been uh, that have come from bacteria, which actually allow you to uh, uh, to do this cut paste operation and. Um, and so the those patterns were um, are called the CRISPR patterns, and um, and the Cas is uh, uh, Cas is an enzyme that is actually used to engineer the the uh, the you know cut and paste operations. Um, this is actually now becoming more and more a pretty standard. Uh, laboratory technique which is used to create various uh, animal models and um, you know uh, and also for uh, various experimental purposes but uh, but it has uh, also this possible impact that um, you know it can it can lead to various uh, therapeutic uh, areas it could lead to gene editing of uh, of crops um, so, for example, Jennifer Doudna uh, established an institute at uh, at Berkeley called the Innovative Genomics Institute. Uh, they are they are trying to develop gene therapies for um, uh, for things like sickle cell disease and so on. Uh, but they're also working with Latin American countries on improving the crop yields of. Uh, uh, important cash crops like uh, bananas, right, uh, uh, and plantains and bananas. So, um, uh, so you know, this has impact uh, beyond just human health. Uh, Emmanuel Charpentier set up a company called uh, um, CRISPR Therapeutics, which uh, has uh, also developed uh, gene therapy using gene editing methods for um, thalassemia and uh, he's now in advanced clinical trials with that. So, so you know, certainly very, very gene therapy and put out the guidelines for uh, gene editing in agriculture. And, um, and I think uh, uh, there is a lot of excitement now about being able to do some of these, uh, uh, get, you know, uh, improvements in uh, varieties of crops and uh, also for to uh, for treatment of patients with genetic disorders. The first genetic uh, gene therapy trials in the country are starting um, uh, have already started at uh, CMC Velour, um, and um, we should be uh, hearing about them soon. Right. Um, the I I touched on a very narrow aspect of. Uh, um synthetic biology particularly on uh, on uh, genomics uh, uh, there's also a lot of work on proteins and um, and as some of you may have read or uh, studied uh, um, you know deep uh, deep mining and deep um, deep mind the group in England that is now part of Google <coughs> solved a very important problem in biology called the protein folding problem, which can actually predict the structure of the protein from the sequence of amino acids that uh, um, that are that describe the chain of the poly of the pepta of the of, of the protein. And um, that problem now has led to uh, the solution to that problem now has led to very new ideas on designing proteins that can do, carry out various functions and including new therapeutics uh, of what are called biologics which are uh, designed using this uh, alpha fold or uh, the deep learning methodologies uh, similarly there's a lot of work going on with virtual patients and digital medicine and so forth so um, you know, uh, people who track, uh, you know, the emerging technologies like uh, 
the World Economic Forum and so on, you can see lots of these uh, new technologies uh, having um, serious impact there. Um, I think all of us are aware of what happened with the pandemic and SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 response. Um, if you look at uh, the history of vaccine innovation in the world, um, what happened with SARS-CoV-2 is uh, amazing, right? Because in less than one year, we went from actually understanding the sequence of the pathogen and actually having a vaccine that was ready for deployment. Um, here at the bottom of that, of that, uh, uh, the chart uh, in the slide actually shows how SARS-CoV-2 actually just collapses to a dot there, whereas the rest are intervals going as far as uh, almost a hundred years, right? Uh, from, from discovery of the pathogen to, uh, to the actual uh, availability of a vaccine. So, you know, one of the things that we're going to see is that uh, this rapid uh, response to uh, new pathogens or even the older ones, uh, we are going to be able to develop uh, vaccines and therapeutics um, at very short uh, time scales. And, and this is great news, right? Um, and we have to, um, you know, uh, probably very soon have vaccines for dengue and, uh, you know, various uh, other uh, uh, viral disorders, uh, uh, which will leverage all of this capability that we saw used uh, for the COVID vaccine. Um, I want to close out now with uh, just some thoughts about uh, the future and where all of this might lead. I think, um, um, you know, this is a, this is really sort of a, um, little crystal ball gazing in some sense, but, uh, but synthetic biology is going to be sort of the focus of uh, probably the rest of this decade. Uh, we will see uh, a lot of uh, new kinds of gene therapies being developed. Um, the views of digital health, uh, is probably including our Ayushman Bharat digital mission um, and uh, wearables that uh, can monitor health. Uh, uh, We're going to see uh, more and more access to healthcare, uh, more widespread access. And by maybe by 2030, we should be seeing some kind of uh, universal healthcare uh, deployed in countries like ours. Um, there are problems of energy storage, uh, which are again, uh, looks like we are making good progress on, um, and, um, and so on, right? Microbes by design, regenerative medicine, uh, India's first stem cell therapy was launched about a month back from a company called Stemputics in Bangalore, which came out of the Manipal, uh, group, um, and, um, and we're starting to see synthetic food where uh, you can actually make uh, uh, meat-like products from uh, vegetables and uh, um, essentially all kinds of interesting new sort of nutritional uh, ideas. Um, the world is moving towards hopefully taking climate change more seriously. And I think uh, we may see some impact of that. Um, um, and certainly, you know, with, uh, um, you know, less, uh, pollution and less, um, um, um carbon emission, um, you know, uh, they could be the changes. Um, and of course, uh, we're going to see, uh, you know, healthy, older people, um, because of, uh, you know, all the work on longevity that is going on. Um, I think uh, we will also see more personalized nutrition based on, you know, uh, uh, the profiles of individuals and, uh, and hopefully we, we will regenerate some of the biodiversity. Of course, uh, uh, India just uh, brought uh, cheetahs back, but uh, 
I mean, I mean in a different way, in, in, a, in a kind of an evolutionary way, we will uh, be able to regenerate uh, biodiversity. Um, but uh, this is really sort of uh, an exciting um, future uh, where uh, I think we could actually be uh, um, looking forward to a uh, uh, resolution of some of the crises that we started out uh, this talk uh, uh, referring to. I think I uh, just want to acknowledge that uh, my journey, um, at least for the last uh, close to 30 years, has been uh, with uh, these colleagues. Um, uh, that's uh, Professor V. Vinay, Swami Manohar, and Ramesh Hariharan, and we were the four uh, professors in computer science that actually created Strand and also made the computer, the handheld computer, um, and uh, essentially started out uh, this journey as entrepreneurs. Um, we took, uh, we were away from ISC for about 10 years to build these companies, and then uh, I obviously return now to, to the campus. Uh, some readings that uh, uh, my, you know, that uh, could expand on some of the topics we touched today. Um, of course, I mentioned Ramesh Haryaran's book. Uh, Eric Topol is a very prolific uh, physician, writer, um, who writes about uh, um, the sort of new paradigms of medicine that leverage artificial intelligence, um, synthetic biology, this book by Jamie Metzl um, called Hacking Darwin is probably one of the best uh, sources. And, um, you know, just this overall optimism of uh, the age of living machines comes from um, Susan Hockfield, who led MIT the first woman and first biologist uh, president of the, of the university. And this is a great book, if you, uh, if you can get hold of it. Um, um, but I just want to end with a little bit of caution as well, that uh, these are very powerful methods and very powerful technologies. And they can be used for good, but they can also be misused. And, um, and so, uh, I think it's important that um, uh, we stay focused on the ethical uses of these technologies and um, not uh, take it in the direction of eugenics and designer babies and so on, which could uh, cause all kinds of uh, problems. So, and that is true also of AI, as we know, bias and so on in AI are big issues. and. Um, and ethics of uh, use of AI has, is also a topic that uh, that needs uh, more discussion and uh, and focus. So with that, I'll uh, stop. I think I uh, unfortunately used up most of the hour, but uh, hopefully uh, we can have a little time for questions. Yes, sure, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, we have some set of questions, and I will read it out one by one, sir. Sure. Yeah. The first question is, uh, uh, it's a two questions, sir. Uh, first one, can the lifespan, that is the age at death of a child be predicted? This question is not to suggest that we play God, but curiosity to know whether age at death is, uh, is predetermined as indicated by our scriptures. Second question, uh, which is a continuation of this is, uh, in, the, in my above question, I mean natural aging death, not accidental or one cost due to the disease or deceased death. Yeah, um, I don't think um, I've seen anything indicative of uh, predicting time of death uh, at uh, at birth. Um, I think unless uh, you know they, this is a situation in. Um, you know, neonatal ICU or something like that, where, where there are some reasons to believe that the child has a risk of, uh, um, you know, of not surviving. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think there have been attempts to think about um, 
you know, people in, who are terminally uh, ill and, uh, and for certain decisions um, that, uh, you know, that may be made on uh, resources or, you know, a family may need to make a decision on, on what type of treatment. Uh, uh, this is a, an area which is actually fraught with uh, ethical concerns. So, <laughs> so, so I think they, it is, um, it is not an area that uh, I'm particularly excited about. So I don't probably look at it, but uh, there may be people who are, uh, but I will leave it at that. I mean, I, I have seen mention in literature. Here and there Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Next question. Uh, when the st uh, stem cell bank would be possible in India? Um, I mean, in some sense, they already are, right? Stem cell banks. Uh, um, you know, I think uh, there are stem, uh, stem cell lines that were developed at uh, uh, places like um, the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, and also at Reliance uh, Life Sciences in Mumbai, and this was way back. Um, uh, and and um, today, stem cell research is uh, is quite uh, advanced, and I think um, we are able to um, um, have induced pluripotent stem cells, um, uh, you know, made from uh, all kinds of tissue. Right? I think. Um, if you, um, uh, so for example, at NCBS uh, campus, we also have the Institute for Stem Cell Research in STEM, which is a DBT institution. And, uh, and uh, you know, there is, uh, there's a lot of work there on, for, for example, um, they take a sample from patients and uh, they can induce neurons uh, from uh, from patient samples, um, and so you don't actually have to, um, you know, do take any brain biopsy, but uh, you can work with those neurons to understand, uh, you know, some of the challenges that the patient might be undergoing. Um, so uh, Nimhans uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health Neurological Sciences, they identify the samples and then collect these samples and uh, we know the medical history and uh, then these samples are converted into neurons and uh, and then you can continue with various experiments and so on so those types of stem cell banks are being created um at cmc velour they're also doing some um, specific haplotype type of uh, classifications uh, where uh, cell, I mean, the uh, samples are coming from, uh, I think that there's a famous registry called Datri in Chennai. Uh, and uh, from that uh, bone marrow registry, I think they are collecting uh, stem cells and, uh, and they're able to, uh, they're starting to do various uh, classifications and create a biorepository. But it's in its early stages. I think um, it's a it's a project that is at CMC Valor, but within uh, a DBT center called the Center for Stem Cell Research, CSRC. Yeah. So, which is uh, on the campus at Bagayam in near uh, near Valor. Right? Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, next sure. next question, uh, dear sir. A very good talk. How acceptable is the computational work than the traditional methods currently going on in cancer research? Oh, in, in cancer research, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what is the question again? Computational methods versus? Uh, the uh, computational method versus the traditional methods going on in the cancer research, sir. Um, so uh, computational methods in the sense that um, um, that we do um, for, let's say, uh, diagnosis um, or early detection, right, of uh, cancer signal. I, um, it's a synthesis of uh, both the molecular biology methodologies and 
computation. And this is where, um, you know, I kept uh, harping on transdisciplinarity and, uh, you know, working, doing these things together, right? Uh, I think um, the, the trick is uh, actually these working together, right? And, uh, and I think um, uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, we were somewhat successful at Strand was that uh, we had uh, computer scientists and molecular biologists, biochemists, uh, all working shoulder to shoulder in teams and were able to, um, you know, uh, get a better sort of handle on, on cancer. I think um, experimental work has to go on. Computationally, you may actually uh, sometimes come up with findings that um, are um, have not been uh, verified experimentally. And um, and then you go into what is called functional genomics. And when you go into functional genomics, you have to actually do something in the lab to actually see if what you're predicting computationally actually makes sense uh, in biology. Because uh, I think, uh, you know, in some sense, compl the complexity of biology and life is so uh, high that uh, your computational ideas will only be always an approximation. It's like modeling, right? Uh, you you create models for insights, not necessarily for uh, very precise predictions, right? And uh, so the interplay between computation and wet lab work is uh, is very important. It can't be one or the other. Sure, sir. Sure. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, uh, the second to next question is in the scenario of uh, India. How do we sensitize the public at large about the potential benefit of these techniques? Yeah. Well, that's a that's a big uh, uh, challenge, of course. Um, and I think um, mm, there is um, well, there is public at large, but there is also sensitizing the physician community themselves. Because, you know, like uh, Eric Topol points out, uh, there is a creative destruction going on of medical practice as we know it as well. And um, so the idea that, uh, you know, that cancer uh, treatment is not, uh, you know, just the traditional, um, you know, what, uh, what was sort of crudely put as um, cut, burn, and poison, right? Which is, uh, you do surgical, then you uh, treat it with, uh, um, you know, a radiotherapy and then chemotherapy. Um, you can do things much more intelligently and with uh, immuno, uh, with, you know, identifying targeted uh, therapies and based on genomic signatures. I think all of these are newish ideas. Um, they get, uh, you know, they get talked about at uh, the thought leader conferences and so on. They get published, uh, but by by bringing it into practice and bringing it into the consciousness of treating physicians and so on is uh, is also a challenge. I mean, that's also a communication challenge. But uh, uh, and then of course. Um, uh, for example, if we were able to develop uh, early detection of cancers, right? Um, you know, the, the question is, uh, can you get uh, patients to, to actually, if they are at risk, uh, you know, take annual checkups or give samples every year and be tested? Um, if you have a family history of breast and ovarian cancer and you're a woman in your uh, you know, mid twenties or over thirty, and you've had your children. Maybe, you know, you want to make sure that uh, that uh, you know you're you're not uh, carrying some um, you know strong sort of uh, predisposition risk. This is like the Angelina Jolie story, and uh, and um, you know. Maybe it's time to start talking to your gynecologist or 
um, a doctor to see if you should have regular checkups, have more mammograms, you know, have scans of various kinds and so on, and um, and be uh, be a little more alert, right? Um, I think uh, it is uh, it is a bit, uh, and of course, have those genetic tests. If, uh, uh, and the 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 interesting thing is, of course, the price point of all of these is rapidly falling because of the exponential laws that we talked about, and so uh, affordability is also improving. And, uh, yeah, okay. So, sure, sir, sure. Thank you, sir. So, one maybe a couple of last questions. This is an interesting one. It is uh, from a, a movie, Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. uh, which was released in 1994, where uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm, who is the mathematician, brought to assess the viability of the dinosaur-themed park by Hammond. Hammond is the owner of the park, and uh, Dr. Ian Ma Malcolm chides to Hammond that you know the genetic power is the most awesome power uh, force the nature the planet has seen, but you wield it like a kid who has found his dad's gun. Mm -hmm. Sir, a do you agree with it? If so, how do we regulate so that it's not misused? Yeah, um, yeah, this is interesting. I mean, I've, uh, obviously, in a movie setting, it's very dramatic and so yes, on. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, but, um, uh, for example, uh, all this gene editing work, right, um, in the U.S. Uh, was rapidly, um, uh, you know, progressing um, after uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier had published their work, and uh, and um, so several uh, Chinese scientists, for example, um, started visiting Berkeley and visiting uh, the Bay Area and so on, and learning some of these methodologies. And many of them got trained there. And um, one group, and in particular one scientist, uh, went back and and actually tried to do something that. Uh, you know, cross cross the line, which was, yes. um, you know, they, they actually modified uh, the DNA uh, genetic code in a pair of twin girls in the embryo, and um, and actually uh, uh, saw those embryos to uh, to actually uh, well, implanted those embryos back, and uh, and these two children were born. With um, with the modified uh, DNA structure, um, and this was not um, the, you know the claim was that the 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 changes he had made were to um, essentially give the children better resistance to HIV, uh, but it turned out that there was also a gain of function experiment that he was carrying out on intelligence and so on. Oh, okay. so, um, and uh, there was a big uh, repercussion to what he had done. And um, Jean Shu, I think, was his name. And he um, he has ended up in prison for, okay. for three years um, because of the international uh, kind of uh, uh, fallout. Of um, yeah, so, so I think... Um, uh, you know, this is not Jurassic Park, but it's uh, but it's playing playing God, right? God. And uh, that's why Jennifer Doudna has actually written a book with her PhD student Sam Sternberg, who's now a professor at Columbia. Uh, it's called a crack in creation. Okay. Right? Because you know, once you once you can dabble with the genetic code, it is um, you're actually in some sense. Um, uh, you know, in, interfering in creation, and um, and so you have to be very careful about what you do there. Um, and uh, and there are actually uh, some anti-CRISPR uh, methodologies that are being developed. Uh, but it's um, the you know the as I ended my lecture, I think I talked about uh, eugenics. Yes. And this is really the problem. I think if uh, uh, if it is not um, properly regulated, um, you know, uh, it, it, it can turn into something very, very dangerous. Sure. Sure. Thank you, sir. And one last question. 
how should the current education system change to produce more professor vijay chandros uh, right no no that's um, um you know it's, it's hard to answer that i i i think you know in the mid 90s when um, when we really started thinking about having more translational impact of uh, our training in computer science electrical engineering um what uh, what we realized was that um, as i was saying we needed sort of this interdisciplinarity and um, the universities uh, at that stage uh, even a place like iisc uh, was actually quite uh, siloed right so yes. so the silos of uh, so as a computer scientist if we if uh, you know i wanted to work in biology um, this was not really looked upon as as very normal right yes and um, and so so there there were no good avenues for interdisciplinary work yes um we tried uh, opening up those avenues of uh, setting up uh, discussion meetings and so on where we invited computer scientists and biologists and so on this was in the mid 90s um but uh, more and more we realized that um the university environment was not ready yet and so we set up the company where we we were able to accomplish that um meanwhile iisc has changed a lot right yes. so now when i've come back uh, 15 20 years later i actually see that um interdisciplinary sciences in fact i sit in interdisciplinary sciences now in the bio systems um science and engineering group and um, and now it's routine that uh, all this interdisciplinarity has come in so um i think uh, it's happening i yes. think uh, we are certainly seeing uh, a lot of people now leveraging this interdisciplinarity okay. i was told uh, sid the society for innovation and development at isc yes. now has about 65 registered companies okay. that have uh, come out of isc faculty and student, uh, student uh, work so so i think um, there's uh, uh, it's a growing uh, you know phenomenon so it's just that i think we somebody had to get it started and, and i think we were <laughs> we were kind of the the, the guinea pigs right uh, <laughs> so you know the, the little story there is that um, mr ratan tata came to iisc in 1998 i think um, normally someone from the tata group is um, no- nominated as the president of the court of the indian institute of science so that year mr ratan tata was uh, nominated and and he came and um, and he in his speech he said uh, you know i love you know being in the campus and seeing all the great things going on but one thing i noticed is that there are no spin off companies right? and uh, he said uh, you know why is that and uh, you know he left it uh, as a as a as a question and a possibly uh, an invitation so we took it as an invitation and we wrote a letter to the director the then director uh, professor govardhan mehta and we said uh, you know our, our lab in computer science has been working on translation and uh, and we believe there will is at least two companies that we can we can uh, start uh, but what are the rules of the institute and professor govardhan mehta said uh, you know well frankly there are no rules but uh, i will <laughs> i will appoint a committee so yeah he appointed a committee and um, and he took it seriously so yes. so it took took a few months of uh, debate with him, with the com- with the committee and uh, presenting them with models that MIT Stanford Cambridge and others had used and um, and then some set of rules were set up and we had a lot of conflict of interest uh, rules uh, that uh, you know so basically at that stage we set up the company outside the campus no students were allowed to to come and work at the companies um until they graduated and uh, only after that they could come yes. and uh, various uh, careful considerations had to be taken because we were the first to do all this 
but i think those norms that were developed has have now been used by many campuses and the iits and so on have have adopted uh, very similar norms sure. i think uh, professor kincha was hp kincha was the uh, head of the society for innovation and development and uh, a lot of credit uh, to his uh, vision and uh, you know in order to make all this possible and uh, and i think his uh, uh, and to the council and the director um, IIC has a certain level of autonomy and can do these things i think uh, uh, so so i think uh, they showed the way and hopefully yeah. now this is a much larger phenomenon so so there are lots of vijay chand news i think you know, <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah thank, yeah. You, sir. thank yeah. you very much thank you uh, yeah with this we would like to thank professor vijay chandru for a very interesting talk but we would also like to thank the audience for coming to samvad uh, from the uh, taking time from the busy schedule the updates of samvad would be put on our website and we request you to visit the website regularly sir thank you once again and good thank evening you. sir thank you sir thank you thank you thank you yeah. yes